common prejudice of many people today who think that history is a process of ongoing um, a progress, improvement, and who think that lives in previous eras, especially before the, the appearance of agriculture and village and cities, must have been horrible, extremely difficult and extremely poor. So it was important for me to, uh, to show that this is not the case, that actually life back then had many positive aspects and that history is not always going from worse to better, from bad to good, but there are good things that we have uh, uh, lost on the way. It is difficult for many people to appreciate it because they compare it to their conditions today. I, I guess many of the people who are watching uh, this lecture are not necessarily poor peasants or poor workers in industry, but many of you are actually belong to the middle class or to the more, more, more affluent uh, layers of society. And when you compare the life of the ancient foragers to your life, then they still look pretty poor and disappointing. But if you do belong to one of the uh, better off uh, uh, classes in today's society, you are not representative of the typical person after the agricultural revolution. You are not even representative of the typical person today in the world. And it is wrong to uh, judge what happened uh, along history from the perspective of this tiny elite minority of middle or upper class people today in the world. And if you judge history from the viewpoint of the more average person, like a simple peasant or like a simple factory worker, then you see that uh, the agricultural revolution was not such a, a wonderful thing, not, not such a wonderful idea, and that in many respects people 20,000 or 50,000 years ago had better lives even than people today in the world. Why do we say that foragers had better diet uh, than peasants who came after them? The main reason is that foragers enjoyed a very varied diet, whereas peasants, most of the people after the agricultural revolution, they were not kings and princes and priests, they, they were peasants. And the uh, kings in the palace might have had uh, wonderful lunches, but the peasants, most of the population, they suffered from a very unbalanced diet, a very unbalanced nutrition. Especially in pre-modern times, most of the calories feeding most of the agricultural population, most of the peasants, usually came from a single crop or just one or two crops, like wheat and potatoes or rice. And when, you, when most of your food comes from a single source, it means that you are in a high danger of not getting all the vitamins and all the minerals and all the other nutritional materials that the human body needs. For example, in China, in southern China, for thousands of years, peasants have been eating rice for breakfast and rice for lunch and again rice for dinner. Meanwhile, in Mexico, peasants were eating maize for breakfast and for lunch maize and for dinner maize. 70, 80, sometimes 90% of the calories came from this single source of rice or maize or in the Middle East it was, it was wheat. And this is not healthy for people to eat just one thing which may provide them with calories but does not provide them with all the various again, minerals and vitamins that they need in order uh, to keep themselves healthy. In contrast, the ancient foragers in most areas of the world ate dozens of different foodstuffs. For example, you might eat uh, mushrooms and nuts for breakfast, and then for lunch you catch some frogs and uh, snails and you eat them, and then for dinner the hunting party comes back with a mammoth uh, steak and you eat mammoth, mammoth steak. And then the other day you have completely different foods to eat. It's estimated that a typical uh, forager band ate dozens and even hundreds of different uh, foodstuffs, both animals and, and vegetable uh, uh, foodstuffs. 
This variety of food ensured that the foragers would receive all the necessary vitamins and minerals and, uh, and other nutrients. There was another big advantage for relying on a huge variety of foodstuffs and not just on just rice or just potatoes or just wheat. By not being dependent on a single kind of food, the foragers protected themselves from all kinds of calamities which hit a particular source of food. In agricultural societies, uh, sometimes there is famine or drought or fire that destroy the annual rice crop or the annual wheat crop. And then a society which is based on rice or wheat starves because there is nothing else. In a forager society, on the other hand, because they eat so many different kinds of things, they are much more protected against natural disasters. They do suffer, or they did suffer, from time to time, from difficult periods when there is not enough food. But usually, they were able to deal with such calamities more easily than peasants, than farmers. Because if the foragers lost some of the usual foodstuffs, because there was drought or fire or some other calamity, they could start gathering on or hunting larger quantities of other uh, sources of food, or they could simply move to a less affected area, because they lived in a very big area, each band roaming over dozens, even hundreds of kilometers. So if there was flooding in the river and it destroyed many of the traditional things that they used to eat, so they would move to the mountains, which were not affected by the flood, and eat whatever they found there. Peasants, on the other hand, they live in a very small place, like a village next to a river. If the river suddenly floods the rice fields or the wheat field, everything is gone, and most likely the peasants will die of starvation. Uh, so ancient foragers had a better nutrition. They also had another big advantage, which is that they suffered less from infectious diseases. Many people don't know it, but actually most of the infectious diseases that have plagued, plagued uh, human societies from the agricultural revolution onwards, and which still harm us today, like smallpox or measles or tuberculosis, they originated in domesticated animals, like cattle and horses and pigs, and were transferred to humans only after the agricultural revolution. Even today, you, almost every year, you hear about new diseases that are being transferred from domesticated animals to humans, like flu. So you have the chicken flu, and you have a, a swine flu, which starts with, with swine, with pigs, and it then moves on to humans. Now, ancient foragers did not domesticate any animals, except for dogs, so they did not receive any of these uh, deadly diseases, any of these uh, infectious diseases. And this is why ancient foragers suffered far, far less than their descendants, the peasants and, uh, and industry workers, as they suffered far less from infectious diseases. Another reason why the foragers were less affected by infectious diseases is that they uh, lived in small uh, communities in small bands roaming around the country, and these were not ideal places for infectious diseases to take hold and spread. In later times, when people started to live in cities, in permanent cities, lots of thousands, tens of thousands of, city, of people living in the same city, in the same place, together with their garbage, and together with their toilets, and together with their pigs and horses and cattle. So these were ideal hotbeds for infectious diseases to start spreading around. And this is why people, uh, after the agricultural revolution, died in, in huge numbers from these diseases. But hunter-gatherers, 20,000 years ago, they lived in small bands of 50, 100 individuals, and they moved all the time from place to place, not staying in one place, close to their toilets and garbage. So it was very unlikely 
that any infectious disease could take hold in such a band and begin to spread around. Uh, the wholesome and varied diet of the ancient foragers, the relatively short working week, and the rarity of infectious diseases have 